The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello and welcome to this week's Crashing Glass podcast. I'm your host as usual, Holly Hurley, and with me today is my co-host, Jill Henley. Hiya, Jill. Hi, everybody. And I also want to give a shout out again to Marissa Levy, who wrote our theme song and definitely has lots of great music online for you to hear. A personal favorite of mine is one of her older songs, uh, Robert Downey Jr., especially timely now that The Avengers is out on the market. So go to iTunes, check her out, or you know maybe while you're listening to this podcast, do a little online shopping. Uh, and then today we're actually speaking of online shopping. you got to have money for that, and to have that, you need a job. So <laughs> <laughs> we are getting chicks hired this week. And to help us with that is Mara Petrosky. Hi, Mara. Hi, everybody. How y'all doing? Great. And Mara has been a recruiter for uh, Thunderbird University Global School of Management. Did I do that? Did I get it correct, Mara? Thunderbird School of Global Management. That's it. Ah, got them back- backwards. Global <laughs> Management. And she's also uh, working for the recruitment department at Washington University. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, higher education recruitment. And uh, while we're while we've got her here, she's actually doing the summer at Craft uh, this year in HR. So we're going to talk a little bit about getting hired for a job and how to basically set yourself up for success. We know a lot of you chicks are coming out of school and looking for some employment. So we're going to try to help you out with that today. So I guess the first first things first, Mara, when somebody's getting ready for a job, what do you think the first thing is they need to think about? Um, I think the first thing is getting ready for a job is what stage in the application process they're in. So if you are you know, still in the application process and you know, you're, you're just starting out, the biggest thing is to, to make your target lists. So that's, you know, where do you want to work? What functional area do you want to work? What kind of environment do you want to work on and work in? Um, you know, if you if you can't solidify that, then your job search is going to be very harried and messy. So, when you talk about targets, what what are some things that people might want to consider when choosing their target company? So, the hot word uh, today is culture. It's company culture. It's all about the feel that you get from the people that you work with, from the community that you're working in, and the environment. You know, do they support working mothers? Do they allow you to leave for a doctor's appointment? Do they encourage creativity? I mean, everyone hears about, you know, the Google culture where, you know, they have the game rooms and the swimming pools and the free food and the beds because they want to kind of insulate that, that work environment and create a, um, a self-sufficient environment. So that's, culture is definitely one of those things that people think about. For example, in craft, everyone's very inclusive and warm and welcoming and encouraging. And, you know, it's, it's very different than, than other work environments. It doesn't feel as competitive, Mara. It feels more of a, like, team welcome kind of feel. Exactly, exactly. And some people do thrive on that competitive environment. But I'm not one of those people. I'm not someone who wants to have to, to fight my way to the top. I'd rather be pushed gently and encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I don't need the cutthroat environment. Um, but so another thought about culture, though, is, is like you said about Google and sort of some of those, you know, companies that, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley companies and just West Coast companies that are leading the crazy environment where they do have swimming pools and and I, apparently they have beds and stuff to take naps, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> and then it seems another big one is bringing your dog to work. You know, like yes. that you can do that not just like once a year. You can do it every day. <laughs> yes. They want to have, they want to be, they want to blur that line between what is personal and what is professional, what is home and what is work. Because they feel the, the idea behind it is the more comfortable that you are at work, the more productive you're going to be. Which is is a, a you know a really great assumption. You know, I mean, really, I, I guess I'm wondering, like, over the years, if somebody looks at the trends of how much pr- productivity comes out of those companies that are blending, blurring those lines versus a traditional company that keeps them more separate. I wonder if the productivity is significantly increased by blurring those lines. I often wonder. Oh, go ahead, Mara. Oh no, no, I was coughing. I apologize. <laughs> 
I, uh, I often wonder also, and I guess this is a good question, you know, when you go into an interview, uh, maybe this is skipping a few steps, and in fact, I'm sure it is, but still, when you go interview, into an interview, let's say culture is really important to you, mm-hmm. but you want to make sure you're also communicating that you're willing to work hard, what's a good way to kind of walk that line? Like, how do you, how do you really say that in, in words that they'll understand? So are you asking how do you get across the drive without alienating the the set culture? Yeah. So I think that's a great question especially when you know when you're looking at you know people that are in our position Holly that are interns that are trying that that lasting impression so that someone will see them as a viable asset and want to give them that offer at the end of the summer. And they do have to walk that fine line between I'm here, I'm ready, I'm raring to go, but not overstepping it and making it uncomfortable. So I think one of the things to keep in mind is taking a look at your surroundings, um, doing what your manager does. You know, if your manager's there at a certain time and he says, you know, I'm, I'm going to be gone at this time and I don't need you after this time, don't you don't need to be staying there till 7 p.m. You know, if your manager's leaving at 5 and he says that you can leave at 5, if you want to try and be the go-getter, stay till 5.15. You don't need to be there all hours of the night. I think it's all about seeing what your environment is already showing you is acceptable. I think that sounds important. And I guess maybe to go back a little bit to the to the beginning, you know, okay, so I've got my list of target companies. Mm-hmm. Where's the best place to start looking You know, nowadays it used to be people would look in the want ads and they'd circle things in the newspaper, you know, and then it was, well, you go to, you go to the website, you go to Monster. Mm -hmm. How how do you find those open jobs today? What's, what's the best place to start? Well, your best resource is actually your network. Um, I had a friend in, when I worked at Thunderbird who, I believe she said, your network is your net worth. So the people around you are what give you your value. And so if you're looking for a new job and a position, your best resource is to reach out to your network and say, what's what's taken at your companies? You know, if you have a friend that's working at Kimberly Clark and you're thinking that that's a company that, that's, that would light your fire and that you would want to be a part of, your best bet is to actually speak to someone that's working there. You know, take a temperature check and see, you know, are there going to be positions opening up? Can you have a coffee date with one of their assistant associate brand managers and see what the feel of that company is like. But um, I think the, the very first step is reaching out to your network today because those are how jobs are being gotten today. And when you talk about sort of crafting your network, you know, I've always found that something very difficult to do in a genuine way. How do you how do you build your network in an organic way? You know, you don't want you don't want people to think you're using them, but you want to make sure that they they they're you know. I mean, how how do you build a network in a really effective way? I think that it differs from person to person, but I think a good maybe rule of thumb would be is to is to play that integrity card. You know, um, because if you are expecting or if you're thinking that this person that you're meeting would, you know, go to bat for you and put your resume forward and, you know, put their political power on the line, then you don't want them to be surprised at who you portrayed yourself to be. So I think playing the the genuine card and, and saying what you're looking for up front and then after that looking to cultivate similarities. I think that that might be a good way of, of doing business today because at least you're being honest and upfront and saying, hey, you know, I know that you work at such and such, and such company or I know that you're friends with so-and-so. You know, I'd really be interested to meet them. I also heard that you do da 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 So, um, so Mara, jumping from, you know, I know we're going to talk a lot about, you know, you, your experience in HR and sort of how to get the process started when you're looking, which is very helpful. I think mm-hmm. for no matter what stage, whether you're at the stage where you're getting your first job or whether you're, if you want to change, you know, mm-hmm. after a while, or if you want to go back to work after you, like where I'm at, you know, in my stage, mm-hmm. where I've been home or been part time for a while. Um, so now, I guess my question though now is about social media. Yes. Uh, do you, so, I mean, most people, you know, most people all the way up to I guess I age you know what 50 or 55 60 60, something like that Uh, you know the majority of people seem to be have in some form of social media I mean Mm -hmm. they're on Facebook or they're on Twitter or they're both and then there's you know many more that they're on Um, however there are holdouts 
there are people that refuse to do it, refuse to do Facebook. So my first question, I guess, is does that hurt you if you don't have an account with Facebook at all? If you just said, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not doing it or I've been on Facebook and now I'm, I quit and I'm done. Because I, I do have friends that are at my stage, you know, whatever, that are late 30s and they um, refuse to do it and they won't get an account. So I just wondered, like, is they're not actively looking for jobs either so right now. But And then my second part is just about people's um social like you you know we were talking about beforehand their social their personality their social media personality and how what what they have on facebook and what kind of posting and pictures and stuff how does that affect their chances when they are going through an interview process those are good questions um i think that for the first question uh when it comes to jobs i think that facebook you know it's good for social and you do maintain your relationships and you know, it takes the place of a high school reunion, but um, <laughs> you, know, you know who's had kids. <laughs> um, but I think that LinkedIn is a more um, job social media site. It's um, it's like a resume on a web page. It's your online resume as opposed to creating a website for it. So I think that LinkedIn today uh, is a very strong self-advocate for your social media presence, especially within the job market. And I think that people that do not have a, an online presence, um, because hopefully everybody on their Facebook has privacy settings enough that if you were to search yourself, that Facebook is not what is available. You would much rather have your LinkedIn profile and your resume be readily available. It shows a sense of openness. Um, it shows it shows honesty in some part. I mean, if you're putting it out there that you've worked at such and such company, people are able to report if you haven't worked there. So, I mean, it's it kind of takes that guesswork out of did this person do this or not. Um, but I think that people that do not have that social media presence today um, that aren't available to be searched, I think that definitely puts them at a disadvantage. It makes you, I feel... Um, I feel like when you can see somebody's resume or you can see people that they're connected to, it creates a another level of understanding with the candidate. And you wouldn't have that if you didn't have that social media footprint. And then when it comes to your social media persona, whatever is not private, you have to be careful because it will be searched, it will be looked at. Employers are constantly making sure that they're double checking. They're not just calling your references because chances are you're not going to put somebody who doesn't like you as a reference. Mm -hmm. They're seeing who you portray yourself to be online because that seems to be um, a, a more apt barometer for your persona. Well, you know, to that point, Mara, I know that um, our producer, Ed, uh, really had a hilarious question for us that he wanted us to get in today. He said, you know, he knows people who've had social media incidents and things they put up online really come back to bite them when, mm -hmm. when it's time for a job. What would be some things you are just, as a rule, suggest trying to weed out of your online presence, and how would you, where would you start? Well... Well, first of all, I'd start with your privacy settings. If your privacy settings aren't on, you're you're going you're going down. Things aren't going to be good for you if you don't know how to work your privacy settings, especially on Facebook. <laughs> now that it's public, um, but professionally, making sure that your LinkedIn, your LinkedIn specifically, making sure that's your professional persona. You know, not not chit chatting, not posting inappropriately, not talking about how wasted you got the other night. That's not LinkedIn. You know, that's that's for your jobs, that's for your colleagues. But um, for Facebook, making sure that you you really watch the tone that people you know write on your wall and what you write on other people's it might sound silly but just your swearing and all of that it seems like common sense but a lot of people don't realize the connection between you know what you're putting out there and then making sure that you know like if you are a um, if you're a PETA supporter and you are applying for a job in a PETA supporting company, and then, you know, you have a picture of you wearing, you know, a wonderful mink coat, <laughs> make sure that that's not available because they will find it, you know? That's that, funny. Yeah, well, and it makes a lot of sense, too. And then, I mean, to that point, you know, every, every job, every company you want to work for, you know, wants you to kind of toe the party line, I would say, to a certain extent. How can you do that with your web presence without sort of, I mean, especially during the job search where you're looking with a lot of companies, mm -hmm. you want to make it clear that you're looking for a position with their company, but you also don't want to alienate anyone else who might want to hire you. You know, during the job search, I often wondered, you know, I was asked to follow Nestle Purina's, you mm -hmm. know, site on Facebook, but I don't want, say, Kimberly Clark to think, well, she's just following everyone. She has no idea what she wants to do. Mm-hmm. 
How do you get a hold on that? That confuses me, actually. Well, see, that goes back to the target list, making sure that your target list is focused. Companies don't care. I mean, it's, it's a positive thing you're looking at different companies. I mean, nobody, like a boy doesn't want to talk to a girl who's, you know, who's got no one to talk to already. They want to talk to a girl who's already being pursued. So mm -hmm. you, I mean, come on, everyone relates back to dating. Um, <laughs> but, but for jobs, you know, you want to be sought after. I mean, one of the, the largest, you know, growth sectors for how recruiters are finding talent today are passive, it's passive talent acquisition, passive recruitment. So somebody at Nestle Purina at, at their talent acquisition is looking at Kimberly Clark saying, God, you know, they've got this amazing brand manager for Huggies. I need them. You know, how do we get them? So it's, it's all passive recruiting. So, I mean, it's good to be pursued by other companies, but it's all about your, your focus list. So you know, you following Nestle Purina and Kimberly Clark and P and G and J and J. Those are all CPG. You know, companies. Those are you know similar trends, similar industries, similar branding um, mannerisms. But if you were following like Kimberly Clark, Nestle Purina, Entertainment Online. You know, Fox News Corporation. That just it doesn't that doesn't show uh, consistency in in your industry of choice and in your scope of your job search. So, show that you're looking at other places because it makes you more wanted. But make sure that it they, they make sense that you can connect the dots on why you would be looking at this company and this company. So you're concerned more, uh, Holly, about Twitter or you know like following people seeing what you're following there or LinkedIn as well. Well, it could be anything. I mean, you know, like on Facebook, I know that, like, I was liking, I was asked to like the Nestle Purina page. And, you know, at, at while I'm at Kimberly Clark, I'm a member of a Kimberly Clark employees page. And, you know, that sort of stuff shows, but you want to make sure that people understand that you're, that you're telling a story. And sometimes that's hard because Facebook is such a place of, like, personal expression. Mm -hmm. it's like, as you were saying, you're, you're, LinkedIn account is really more a story and I also find it hard with LinkedIn because I think a lot of times I was freelance for a long time and I know a lot of contractors have trouble with telling a coherent story because it often looks like you're sort of schizophrenic in your job search. Is there sort of a, is there a way to work around that at all or is there any advice you typically give people? I think that um, again it was what what you said earlier, it's the it's coherence and it's connecting those dots. That's really what the big thing is. It's you know, so you're a member of the Kimberly Clark Facebook page, but the fact that you're following Nestle Purina, that doesn't that isn't a disconnect. There's clear connections on why you would have both of those presence in your social media world. And that's the same thing with your freelance work. Yes, maybe fully freelance resumes and freelance uh, LinkedIn accounts do look a little um, discombobulated because there's so much turnover and there's so many different projects. But how is that any different for a consultant who's writing about all of the different projects that he or she has worked on? So it's all about connecting those dots and making sure that your your story is a coherent continuation of, of your growth. And, and just jumping over to kind of that persona like you've said, what about what I would worry about um, is and not so much personally because I don't do much of this on Facebook or Twitter, but is the political beliefs and, and, and that's such a you know that can ignite so much oh I don't know you know emotion and and people are can be so polarized about politics and so I noticed that you know some of my Facebook friends uh, often have very polarizing political comments and and, and things that they put on their Facebook page. Does that come into play at all when you're looking for, you know, applying for jobs? Absolutely, Joe. Couldn't stress it enough how how much you should remove oneself from uh, from any sort of political banter or political side taking when it comes to your social media self, especially within the job search. Um, people get very set. People are sensitive. You know, it's their money, it's their country, it's their their beliefs, and um, people personalize it and yeah. internalize it. And so, you know, if you're looking for a job and you know you're you're because chances are if you you know, I like if you internet stock your interviewer, chances are doing they're doing the exact same thing back to you. And if they find in your social media footprint something that 
offends them or rubs them the wrong way, you're already at a disadvantage walking into that interview. So instead of taking that chance, just wipe your slate clean. You know, I have a political background. I worked in politics before, but there's no, just because I worked in it, there's no sense of it anywhere else in my social media. Okay. Well, thank you. That's great information. I wonder um, when you talk about that, like, okay, let's say you are tr- you are someone who is trying to get a job in politics. So how mm-hmm. what would how would you handle the reverse situation? Well, that's that's a different story. I mean, if you are if you're trying to get into politics, you really have to pick your issue, and you have to pick your barometer. You know, I mean, people people today see a lot of you know far left, far right, and they don't see the moderate. And I feel like if you are looking for a position in the political world, A, it's all networking. So it's all about who you know. And if who you know doesn't like who you're portraying yourself to be, you're at a disadvantage. So I would say pick a moderate path or don't have any presence of it online. Just because your work life is a certain way does not mean that your your social media self has to be that way. Going to act, like posting those, um, when people post those uh, really fiery hot button topic, you know, uh, things as their Facebook status. That's, that's a no-no uh, in, in every way, shape, and form. Eve, especially if you're going into politics, you don't want to be asking those questions. You want to be part of the answer. So rather than, rather than put that out there, let, that, let those political um, situations come to you professionally. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. So I guess I guess we talked a little bit about sort of preparing. Nowadays, um, wh- how how many different ways do you need to have your resume prepared? This has been an ongoing thing. I think I feel like my, I'm changing my resume every week. Um, Mara, I was wondering the same thing that Holly asked about resumes. Well, yes. Um, today, there absolutely is the need to tailor your resume. I don't say making a whole new one, but having pieces of it that you know are easily moldable depending on the industry and company. Now hopefully you're staying within a similar industry because it makes your life a lot easier. Hopefully you're not jumping from you know CPG to tech because that's a huge jump. But if you're if you're looking at um, for example going from a you know a Kimberly Clark to a Johnson and Johnson. Johnson and Johnson is all about health and wellness and in that industry. So you would want to take a look at your experiences and see, all right, how is this relatable to health and wellness and and all that follows. And then you would want to tailor little bits and pieces of that um, to to that industry. But one of the ways to get around it, which is what I do because I I do not have different resumes. I have one resume. I update it when I want to, but that's the only resume that I use. The way that I get around that is via my cover letter. Um, on my cover letter is what I really use to tailor it to different industries and different functional, not functional areas, but different, um, different positions. Because it allows you to really take the why you're applying to that position with that company and make it special within your cover letter because your resume is really just a checklist, you know, of experiences and, and actionable items that you've participated in. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's I think that the difficulty too is nowadays, you know, you typically have one on LinkedIn that you keep on LinkedIn. If you're in a master's program like you and I are, typically the career center keeps a copy up in their files. Mm-hmm. And then you also have the ones that you send to each and every company. And I feel like sometimes it's difficult to make sure all of them are up to date. And I, I wonder sometimes let's say someone goes on my LinkedIn and looks at my resume or let's say I apply for a job through LinkedIn, which nowadays you can pretty much do, mm-hmm. you know, um, how, how do you manage those things and how would you prioritize them? Does it depend on the situation or? I guess for me, um, I'm a creature of habit and I'm severely OCD when it comes to that sort of thing. So whenever I make any sort of update, I kind of make the rounds and make sure it's updated on all, all, ends. But I think if you had to prioritize, um, once you make the corrections on your on your soft copy that is your own um, copy of your resume, then I would first go to your social media presence and make sure that that position is updated. You know, making sure that people can see that, oh, now you work for Kraft or now you work for Kimberly Clark. And then from there, you know, you want to go on and update it at your career center. You want to make sure that it's um, at the different places, at the different Taleo sites that the companies use. Make sure that you're making those rounds and updating all of those 
um, pieces of emailing your recruiters. I mean, it might sound like a pain, but it actually makes the recruiter's job a lot easier when you're sending them, oh, you know, I wanted to give you an updated experience. So when, you know, you come back and fall and, you know, you're, you're starting that full-time job search, you're going to be speaking to people that you've already created relationships with. Why not make their job easier and send them your updated information? Wow. And, and what do you think, when it comes to keeping in touch with, with your recruiters, with your HR people, how, how do you think, what is the, the best format to do that with? Is it dropping an email every once in a while? I mean, like, how often should you contact them? Because I always worry about the, like, whole seeming creepy thing. You know, you don't want to, like, stop them. You don't want to, like, you know, I'm a little creepy. I don't know. So, like, how do you, you know, how do you do that in a way that's respectful of their time and efforts but also keeps you in the game? I think it depends on the relationship that you've cultivated with that recruiter. Um, if you've cultivated a, a friendly banter relationship, then, you know, dropping them an email, you know, once a month or once every other month just saying, hey, I wanted to let you know what I'm doing right now. I hope things are going wonderful at such and such a company. Um, let's find a time to talk in the next couple months. Or I hope I catch up with you in the next big recruiting cycle. You know, that's, that's nothing wrong at all. But maybe for someone that you're not as close with, um, what I did when I officially accepted my offer with Kraft is I sent emails out to each of the recruiters. I personalized them, and I said it was wonderful going through the pipeline with you. I so appreciate your time. I wanted to let you know that I did accept the position at this firm working on these projects. I'm really hoping to develop you know, my capabilities and competencies in this area, and I would love to uh, reach out to you again in the fall if that's okay with you. I think that if you do it in the question form, seeing that if it's okay with them to keep that door open, I think that it, it becomes a less aggressive move and it stops you from being the quote unquote, you know, creepy stacker to the recruiters. <laughs> I've run into that as well with as when I sometimes I'm going in for auditions and I think that in that line of work there's actually of course there could certainly be people stalking stalking creepy stalkers but really the more you get your resume and headshot in their hands the better chance you have of getting a call I mean it's almost like I don't know if I think it's a very different world there because I'm always like like Holly said I don't want to be completely over the top like always in their face sending my stuff in but that's what you're supposed to do that's what they tell you to do so mm -hmm. Even the people that, you know, that are the casting directors tell you to do that. So it's just interesting how there's diversity among different fields. And Absolutely. So I just had a thought, Mara, that kind of like switching a little bit to specialization, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, that you're in HR, you know, now and you've, and you've got a lot of, you know, experience with recruiting. So it seems like. Uh, what I've found in my personal, or I should say professional experience, personally, is that I came out of being um, a high school teacher, and I think sometimes people who have taught, taught, uh, been a teacher, you feel like, oh my gosh, I could do anything because it's such a difficult job in some ways, you know, but mm -hmm. it's also very insular in some ways, you know, so meaning you're, you're sort of in your own little world, but it is a t tough day-to-day -day kind of job. And so when I came out of that, I did apply for into um, admissions, college admissions, to be mm -hmm. a, a um, admissions officer or counselor for, for schools. And it, I was so surprised to hear that they wanted somebody, and this was an entry-level position, but they wanted someone with admissions experience. You know, they wanted someone with who had volunteered in, probably in their undergrad, you know, as giving tours or doing whatever and here I am thinking, oh my gosh, I just came out of five years of teaching high school. I could, I feel like, I felt like I could do anything because it, that seemed to me that that was one of the hardest jobs that I may ever have. <laughs> and then I was like, I can't believe that they want me to be so specialized. Like, you know, to only, they, we only want to look at people's or interview people. And, and I did get the job actually. Someone took a chance on me and I got into admissions. But even once I was in, if we would have someone new prospect coming in to interview they were throwing out resumes if you know if the person didn't have any specialized experience and I'm sitting there thinking oh my god is this how the whole world is you know <laughs> so I wanted to throw that up to you I was actually reading an article about um, there were there's some old Greek philosopher and he said you know a, um, a head 
hedgehog is a general league. It's like a hedgehog has one trick and a fox, you know, has many tricks. And, you know, the moral of the story is that, that all the hedgehog can do is curl up into a ball and, like, roll around, and that's, you know, pretty much it. Whereas yeah. um, the fox, because it's a generalist and it has lots of different skills, it can, it, you know, will end up maneuvering the hedgehog into the water, you know, so it can win or something like that. It's, it, that's the, the thought behind it. But the idea today is actually moving towards a generalist, not just being so specialized in, in certain fields. And, of course, I think that different different functional areas have different preferences, but as a whole... The um, the business culture is moving towards more of a um, a generalist um, ideal. They want pe- people to be jack of all trades. They want people to be able to be lateral movers and lateral growers, and to have different skill sets. And so, people that come in that have different backgrounds are actually hot commodities. So, you know, it might be for that you know one school that they wanted that admissions experience, but. A lot of businesses today are really looking at different backgrounds and saying, this person is going to bring something new to the table, and they're not going to be so focused and inundated in this, you know, one specialty. They're going to be able to see outside of, of what's going on right in front of them. So that's what companies are really liking today. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, in the Navy, and again, this was, I mean, that was actually 10 years ago, so it, I'm sure the... I'm glad to hear that it, it that has shifted because it does. It seems like it does seem like um, breadth in some ways. You know, in your even in people's lives and their personalities, it's it's nice to have the depth, but to just have someone that's only focused on you know had this one line of experience versus someone who's done other things. And like you said, the word lateral has that ability to move laterally. Mm-hmm. Maybe that just suits who I am too. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we talked a little bit about, um, we talked a little bit, we're sort of touching on it now, about sort of how to leverage your current experience. I know a lot of that happens if you can get there now that we've talked about the cover letter in the interview. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, let's say you've got the right resume, you're going in for a job. What are some of your your recommendations on preparing for that interview? Because I realize a lot of what happens in the room is based on what you do before. Absolutely. I think that when preparing to get into the room, First and foremost is know who you're interviewing with, the interviewer if possible, but the company itself and understanding how you can become an asset to them and how they, you know, can aid you in your professional growth. I think understanding that before you walk in the door and before you start the rest of your preparation is a real key and it's a real, you know, game changer for you as an interviewer. Um, But I think other things to prepare... um, really go along the line of self-awareness. Being, showing an employer how you're self-aware about your strengths, your weaknesses, your, what you want to do, how you want to grow, where you see yourself in five years. Being self-aware and showing that to an employer really speaks loud and clear and it, um, it makes a big difference. And so I think that in your preparation, making sure that you're highlighting parts of your past experiences that that you're showing that you know what you've done and why it's important and why this company should want to talk to you and why you want to talk to that company. I mean, I, and I know that sounds really broad, but, you know, doing strengths finding quest, um, strengths finders, um, those, those different Myers-Briggs-like um, surveys that kind of show you your different strengths, it might sound silly, but they really do speak to a different level of employers when they're seeing that you took the effort to get to know yourself better as a professional. I think that that shows something. So what are some ways you can research the companies you're interested in just for people who maybe haven't done this yet? Um, Well, first and foremost, the company site. You know, there's a lot of information that is available by the company themselves, and it's actually preferred information. You know, they're, they're giving you that information so that you don't see anything, you know, false out, outside of their company. Um, so outside of the company website itself, you've got Glassdoor, you know, which will have interview questions. It will have employee salary, reviews, um, lots of different tidbits that aren't normally, you know, on the company website. Glassdoor.com is a, is a great resource. Um, LinkedIn. Searching the company on your LinkedIn will show you if you have any contacts that you potentially didn't know worked at this company or know somebody that worked at that company. And then you could reach out to that person and talk to them and get to know the com- you know what's, what's the insider information that's going on. And then lastly, but 
incredibly important is doing a news search on the company, but not just looking at articles that were published in the last two weeks, looking at articles that were published a year ago, six months ago, two years ago, and really getting to know the growth of what the company has been doing. Because everybody before an interview will Google, you know, and look at the first, you know, three results on the news for a company. And so the recruiter knows that, <laughs> you know, it's common knowledge. But what they want to know is how long of you or how in depth do you know our company? So then I guess maybe at this point, you know, you're getting ready to enter the interview. What, what happens then? So as a woman, making sure that you, you feel confident and you feel, you feel set and ready. So that's everything from head to toe, making sure that you look good, you feel good, your clothes are ready, your resumes are printed, your portfolio is there, you know, you know how to get there, when to get there, all of those little details. And then the day of the interview, recognizing that your interview starts the moment you walk in the building. It's every single person that you speak to, from the doorman to the secretary to your first interview, everybody you should consider as a potential interviewee. Because if you don't think that all of those people aren't reporting back to their HR managers and to those hiring managers, you'd be dead wrong because everybody is involved in that process. So getting in that door and then once you get in that door, taking a deep breath and then just going with the flow, not trying to force certain topics during an interview. Some of my favorite interviews that I've had have had nothing to do with the jobs that I was applying for. I think one of my interviews for Kraft with one of the with one of the HR managers, I think we ended up talking about Brazilian President Lula for a good 30 minutes and about certain policies that were in place. You know, it was we, nothing, nothing about what I was going to be doing. But it's about going with the flow and creating those relationships so that interviews, making sure you get the person's contact information so that you can reach out and thank them afterwards, and then leaving with style and class. <laughs> and just, you know, making sure that you enjoyed yourself as much as the, your interviewer enjoyed themselves. It's nice when you walk out of an interview and you feel like you really connected, you know, or, you know, just have that really nice. It actually, it's rapport, really. It's that nice rapport that you had with people and you think, and it doesn't mean it's a guarantee, but it's such nice. You said, well, I did my best, you know. <laughs> exactly. So, I don't, and I it, think I might be, oh, oh, go ahead. No, go, Mara. Oh, and I was just about to say, and it also stops you from burning a bridge with that company later on. Because if you don't get the position, so what? you might get at something later on because that recruiter will keep you in mind. That's right. That's a good point. Well, I don't, I don't have anything else that comes to mind, but Holly, I'm thinking you might have a couple last things, questions. Well, I think, you know, a lot of people talk about thank you letters, and I have been told by some people recently that the, the email, the thank you email, is actually in some cases more effective because then when they want to reach out to you and ask you further questions, they have your email address. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on sort of email versus phone call versus hard copy letter? I'm going to say veto on the phone call altogether. Uh, you never know what somebody is doing. You never want to impose on their time. And sometimes it's an awkward thing. Some people don't like receiving gratitude. So I would say veto on the phone call altogether. But um, I think the email itself is its a great tool to use. Because say you interview someone you know, tomorrow or you interview with someone tomorrow, you send them an email tomorrow night and you're showing them that they're top on mind. You're using something from that interview to remind them of what you spoke about and you're really reaching out immediately. And then that also allows you, you know, in two or three weeks time or whatever timeline they gave you in the interview to reach back out again and show the continued conversation. That's what's really great about email. A hard thing about actually mailing a physical letter is you know, if there's a time crunch and the interviewers are, are going through many different candidates, if another candidate sends a thank you email that night and then they get a thank you letter from you two weeks later or a week later, that might have been a tipping point in somebody else's favor. So there's nothing wrong with sending thank you letters after a position has already been given or an offer has already been given saying, you know, thank you for that. But I really am a big proponent of the use of, of modern technology and emails for the reaching out and the thank you. That's good advice. And so then, you know, at what point do you do the following up versus waiting it out? Well, in the interview, hopefully you, you've had the, the wherewithal to ask, hey, what's the timeline? What am I looking at? Because if you don't have that conversation or ask that question, you're really a fish out of water. So hopefully you've asked that question. 
And then, you know, if they say, oh, you know, we need two weeks or we should, should be hearing from us in three weeks, whatever timeline they give you, add, you know, four days to a week onto there and then do the follow-up. So if someone says, you know, I'll reach back out to you, you should hear from me in two weeks, and you didn't hear from them in two weeks, give it a couple more days, and then you reach back out. And you say, hey, I just wanted to touch base. But if you have not had that conversation with somebody, I think the two-week rule is a good rule. So if you hadn't heard from them in two weeks, reaching back out a couple days after that is, is a good barometer time. -wise. Well, that's really helpful. So then let's say, you know, you do, you have like you and I are during or in an internship period. What are just some general rules you would suggest across the board for, for really showing your interest, getting an offer, and also making sure that you're really getting the right feel for the company? Well, it's funny because, you know, you and I being in this right now, it's, you know, front lines. But I think some some really good advice that I've been hearing and through my, my conversations with my, my mentors have been being yourself but being the best you that you can be in front of those in front of the people at work you know I mean not saying being fake and, and not presenting yourself to be honest but being the best you that you can be uh, making sure that you're if they give you an assignment you're exceeding those expectations you know you don't need to be the first one in but making sure that when you are there you're being productive and you're making an impact and you're asking questions and you're involved and you're seeming interested in things that are outside of your projects. I mean, and when they give you projects, taking them to another level. You know, if they don't give you, it might be the littlest thing, like if they give you a project and they don't give you a timeline for it, create a proposed deadline and shoot it over to your manager, showing him, you know, when you're going to be giving him certain deliverables. But just making sure you're having those continued conversations, I think, are really positive things. Um, another really wonderful thing, if they don't, if your company has not presented itself, uh, with mentors and like a buddy um, within the internship process, ask for one. Reach out, ask for a mentor, ask for a buddy. Craft actually has a wonderful program where a mentor is um, somebody that's, you know, five to, you know, ten years your senior in the company and in your functional area. But then your buddy is someone who is maybe only a year or two ahead of you. Um, it's kind of, you know, just been in your shoes. And so finding somebody that has that recent experience will be an incredible vault of knowledge that you can draw from and learn from. And I think that really creating those relationships and having real conversations with your manager about how you want to develop as a professional, I think those are good things to keep in mind. Well, I think that's really helpful. And then, of course, now I guess we're entering into, into an arena in which we want to ask the question, so you get an offer. Let's say you get an offer and you want to accept it, but you want to maybe, I mean, do you just accept the first offer right off the bat? How, how do you handle an offer? So that's a really good question. That's, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the things that you have to keep in mind is the economy itself. Not selling yourself short, of course, but understanding the state of the economy. But, you know, having that in mind, um, once you get your offer, Make sure you do your research. You know, what is what is industry trends? What are average MBA salaries for this field, for this industry? Make sure you know what, or not, sorry, if you're not an MBA, what are other average salaries? My head is so in MBA world. <laughs> um, <laughs> but making sure you understand what the industry is, is saying related to pay grade about the position that you've been offered. And then if you feel that, you know, you, you merit more compensation or you need more vacation time or if you need certain things in order to have a better work-life balance, there is nothing wrong with having a conversation about that with um, the person. So it might be your HR representative, it might be your hiring manager, it depends on the company, but there's nothing wrong with having a, a conversation about it. Um, obviously, it is something that you want to keep in mind that you're being appropriate and you're being um, you're being cognizant of the fact that, yes, it, it, you did receive an offer and they do like you, but there's nothing wrong with actually asking those questions. You know, maybe there is an opportunity for, you know, more vacation time that you wouldn't have known about, or maybe there is a relocation, you know, fund or a relocation um, bonus that you can ask for that you wouldn't have known about if you hadn't had that conversation. But I think a big thing is knowing your industry. And then, you know, if you do sign a, and if you do receive an offer from an internship, 
making sure that you speak to past interns and see what was your process in receiving your offer or, you know, people that are, are newly minted within the company, you know, what were their processes? A lot of that information is found online, actually, but I think having the conversation with people around you and then with your hiring manager is, is probably one of your best bets, uses your resources. Let's say, you know, just for, I know we're running out of time here, but I, I want to address some of the recent grads who may be thinking about going to higher education or maybe going to college. How much of this would you say also applies to that search and what, and what are recruiters looking for in that scenario? So graduate school is, is a big thing. I mean, it's, it's a huge trend because people can't get, people aren't getting the jobs that they think they, they deserve. And so they're saying, okay, well, I'm just going to go back and get my master's because then I'll be able to get the job that I want. If you think about it like that, you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage because you were, after graduating from your master's without any experience in between, you're putting yourself in the exact same job pool as somebody who just finished their bachelor's, but you're saying to these employers, hey, I'm more expensive, but I have the same amount of real world experience. So. I really think that people need to take a step back and think about why and what they want to accomplish with their graduate degree and to not jump into it. There's nothing wrong with working at an entry level position for, you know, one to two years out of your bachelor's. I mean, it's it really it's a character building activity and it it's what drives you to know what you actually want do in higher education or with your master's in the future. Um, and then also understanding back to the social media presence, not only are employers looking at you, but colleges are looking at your presence, um, graduate recruiters, all of the, everybody is looking at you. I think that's great advice, Mara, because I do think people come sometimes, unless they have a depth, an absolute path where they want to go right to dental school or, or medical or school or, you know, where they're just sure that once their undergrad is done, that's only part of their, their path at mm -hmm. the time. But otherwise, I think working in an entry-level position for a couple of years, you actually, I think you'd be surprised how much you learn about about what it's like to be in the workforce, and, and it really would, well, though, what those experiences that you have in that first position and that first job really end up shaping what you really, you want to do, and, and mm -hmm. then you can cater what, or well, what do I want to go back and get? Do I want to get an MBA, or do I want to get something else? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really great advice for college students that are, you know, graduating and trying to figure out what to do next. Well, and I wonder, too, you know, when, you, when you're when you preparing for an application to school, you're also sort of preparing a resume, and mm -hmm. a lot of times you are preparing a literal resume, and would you think of that process as almost being exactly like a job process, because you are going to ask them to give you money, and among other things? I, you know, it, you, that's right on. I mean, it's, your, the, your application for school is think about it very similarly. My brother is actually going through the process right now. He's applying to, to veterinary school. And um, he, he gave me his resume last week. And he got very upset with me because I cut his four-page resume down to one page. And I, he cried very painful tears on the phone. But um, you know, you want to think about it just like you would do as an employer. I mean, what kind of flip forward do you want to present yourself to these schools? I mean, how do I want these admissions people to be looking at my brother's resume? I want them to see that he, you know, has been a vet tech in an emergency pet hospital, that he is a volunteer um, foster parent for, you know, dogs and cats, that he went to doctors without, vets without borders. You know, there's certain things that I want to highlight, but then there are a lot of other things that people don't need to know about. And so it's all about that balance of, you know, how much, how much do you need? How little do you need? So I think that thinking about grad school applications as if it's a job, job application is a really good way to think about it. It's a good lens. Nice. So I guess, um, Jill, do you want to maybe try a little good, bad, or indifferent? <laughs> I do, Holly. I do. I think, Mara, that was just so helpful. I think you really took us like the whole, we went the gamut of, of, for chicks who are looking to looking to get jobs, <laughs> and just in that in that perspective from someone who's on the other side of the of the interview table, you know that was really great. So thank Thanks, you, for, yeah, for all your in depth answers. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, guys. 
So, so yeah, we're ready, Holly. So typically, Mara, on the show, we play a game called Good, Bad, or Indifferent. And what we do is we'll choose a movie, a website, or a person on occasion. Uh, prior Good, Bad, and Indifference have included celebrities like Tyra Banks and Britney Spears. And we will decide, are, are they? do we think they are good, bad, or indifferent? And we will give our reasons why. Um, so feel free to pick a topic you think is relevant to working women. And we'll have a little conversation about good, bad, or indifferent. Hmm, okay. I may... I, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you I just got, had a quick question. Yeah. I, had a, I had a qualifying question. Good, bad, um, how are we qualifying the good and the bad? However you see fit. It's basically a purely subjective question, I'd say. Wouldn't you agree, Jill? I, <laughs> yes, completely subjective. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, as long as you can make your own case for it, we'll totally buy it. That's, uh, <laughs> that's basically... So I, I, maybe I want to start since uh, some what to it's what to expect when you're expecting came out, um, pro, you know after our last show and before this one, I would love to ask the question, you know, what do you guys think about this sort of comedic take on the process of having a baby? Oh God, well I haven't seen it, so I don't I I don't know. Mari, have you seen it? Yes, and I think it's great. I think it's good, good, good. <laughs> so I think it's I think it's great because um, I think it it takes a lot of that fear out of it. I mean, for people that didn't grow up in families, I mean, I come from an anomaly, I, mean, I don't know if it's an anomaly, anomaly, can't pronounce. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I come from a really large family. My mom's one of four sisters. I mean, they have like 19 first cousins. So there's always babies and, you know, working and uh, always children around me. And so I always knew what to expect when people were expecting. You know, that, I, there didn't need to be a movie about it. You know, it was... It was somebody else that's pregnant. I know what's going down. But um, I think for people that don't have that experience and don't have that uh, awareness, I think that putting a comedic spin on it allows people to take in a really scary topic in a in a easier easier pill to swallow way. I'm sure. I mean, I'm all about the cop comedy with when you're expecting because it's. I mean, if you if you're not too seriously, you're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> So I, I can't wait to see it. So I just I'll say good. I, and I also like um, you know the big names that I you know have I know that are in the movie acting in the movie all good. Well, one question that I have about this, I guess, is that I feel I, I did see it and I only felt indifferent because it was funny, but it looked even funnier on the commercials. Like I think I expected there to be a few more surprises. Mm -hmm. You know, but I but I think. Uh, but I think I did really enjoy it, and I especially like the portrayal of the men in the movie. So even though I'm indifferent about it in principle, I enjoyed it actually as a movie, I think. <laughs> did, who were the main male characters? I mean, who were the actors that played the male character? Well, main is a, is a strong word. Yeah. Um, there, was, there was one main guy, actually, and I am going to look him up because I don't want to get his name wrong because I've only seen him in a couple of other things. Um, so the main, the main male character, like the husband of the main girl, was Rodrigo Santoro. And, um, oh, yeah, and I, li I like him because he was the architect in Love Actually that, uh, oh. that I believe. I believe, yep, that's right. He's Carl, the architect in Love Actually that Laura Lenny falls in love with. Um, and he plays the uh, husband of Jennifer Lopez, and they're, you know, frightened about having babies. And so he's sort of the main guy, but there are a number of them. And I would say Chris Rock, I'm glad to see him taking kind of a fun, quirky, um, quirky friend role because I think he plays that really well uh, along with Thomas Lennon who does a lot of writing for Reno 911 um, among other things and uh, yeah the, the father scenes were just really funny. Well I remember Carl from Love Actually very well. <laughs> he was a good that. looking man. Yeah and I've seen that movie you know what, 15 times <laughs> <laughs> so that makes me more excited to see the uh, expecting movie. Nice. So what about you guys? Any, uh, any good, bad, or indifferent for us this week? I have one. Good. Shoot. <laughs> if you don't mind me shooting one out. Um, for women especially, the pantsuit versus the skirt suit. <laughs> Ooh, that's a I know. Way to throw down. Welcome to my world, all right? That's a, that's a tough one. Wow. You, you're not... You you're not warming us up. You're getting us right in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, whenever the word pantsuit, whenever I see or hear that word anywhere, I think of Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> 
And you remember why? It's just she had a quote during the two thousand, um, I guess two thousand eight. No, it was actually her Senate race more than her presidential race. I think so. Whatever the year that she ran for New York State Senator, I and I'm going to say maybe two thousand two or so. I don't know, something like that. Two thousand four. And she, I remember her talking about her black pantsuits and how <laughs> she she went just on the campaign trail for that senate you know that that senate campaign she went through like uh, some exorbitant number of black pantsuits like 18 or something crazy and i remember thinking hillary like it's like if i played one of those games of association in pantsuit <laughs> it's hillary clinton um I, I would say though from a outsider here who has not been you know interviewing or anything lately but um i would say that the skirt suit is is the more conservative kind of more making an impression um in some ways it's still that old school feel where you can look very current but you've still got the skirt on so i don't know i, I want to hear what you guys have to say because you're more in the midst of it i think i you know i like i like pantsuits for here's the thing i know that skirt suits are probably the right choice for interviews but i often end up wearing pantsuits for a number of reasons and one of those is that very less can go wrong like as far as having not shaven your legs or having knobby looking <laughs> knees or like sometimes my knees i often say and i hope people don't get offended by this i am the ashiest white girl i know i just you know i don't have like my skin flaking off in my interview and be worried about like maybe turning the wrong way and flashing someone and really i know that like skirt suits are the better option but I also like having pockets even if I'm not going to use them I know you're not supposed to use the pockets in your suits but I do and I like having them and I think when skirts when skirt suits have pockets I'll probably be in like yeah, I think that the, the whole idea with skirts too is throw you throw out the idea you have to wear uh, nylons or hose and I know that they're sort of very out like those are seem to be pretty out of fashion and I, I actually haven't worn them in a long time but I had my good friend the other day say that her company requires pantyhose. <laughs> yep, actually there's a couple of our, our fellow MBAs are interning at a company this summer that only recently revoked the nylon rule. Yeah. It's only been recently removed so... <laughs> That's just crazy for me to think about. I Like nylons to me seem just so antiquated and obviously like I understand the benefits behind them, but at the same time, I'm just like, oh, God, but could you have picked, like, a less comfortable, stays-in-place, worse product? Yeah. yeah. So I guess for me, um, with pantsuit versus skirt suit, I just think the skirt suit is so flattering when well done. I mean, if you get it tailored right, and, of course, you want to get it at the proper height, you know, so maybe you don't want to show your ashy knees. Um, but if you get it, <laughs> but if you get it tailored appropriately and you make sure that it's the right uh, length for your arms, I think that it's so flattering. And I think that a lot of times when people get pantsuits, especially women, when they get the pantsuit, they don't get it altered appropriately. And so it just ends up looking like you went in your mom's closet and you pulled out a Hillary pantsuit and you threw it on <laughs> and you ran out the door. So I, I'm, I really am a proponent of the of the skirt suit, and preferably in in grays and in in greens and blues. I'm not a fan of the black suit anymore. Oh, cool! That's good to know. Um, so yeah, and I have the obvious knees on the planet, Holly. So I can't, you can't, you cannot beat me in that that one. I am <laughs> that's hands down. <laughs> I will take a picture of my knees, and I will I will send it to you. All right. Well, I'm trying to think of one last good, bad, and indifferent. Um, Father's Day, <laughs> although that's not about about chicks per se. But let me throw this out there, just given that it's this week is we're celebrating Father's. Do you guys think that there's still? Well, all right. I'll make it more philosophical here. Let me go even further. Do you think that a woman's self-esteem? And her kind of com comfort and confidence with herself is is strongly connected to the way her she the way the relationship with her father, whether yes. as a kid or as an adult. Absolutely, you do, one hundred percent. So that's a good good. <laughs> it's a strong correlation there between. <laughs> yes. Good. Yeah. It, there's a if if we are asking if good fathers help make good self esteem and bad fathers make bad self esteem, I fall on the side of good.
Good fathers make good self-esteem, and even good fathers sometimes are connected to some of the problems that girls have with their self-esteem just because they don't really know how to, what to do with their daughters. And I, uh, I, think, uh, I think there's a very strong connection there. Yeah, I have to agree. I think that the relationship, the role that the father plays in, in his daughter's life is is very important. Um, I, I think that there is a strong correlation between um, maybe a more a more socially developed, I, I don't know if that's the proper, the, the right phrase to say, but I guess the more socially developed and the more socially ready um, women had, you know, more of that positive relationship with their fathers. I, I, the, the more I go through life, you know, the more life I live, <laughs> I feel that, and I, and it, and I don't mean to get so serious because I know uh, we like to play this game and have it be light. But it made me. It just popped up when I thought about you know Father's Day and strong women and and chicks having strong you know a strong self esteem and and self confidence. Especially Jill, when you look at like in the workplace. Um, I remember when I was younger going to visit my father at his at his company, um, which he was at, he's been at for, I want to say around 20 or so years. Um, and I remember how everybody talked to him and how he spoke to everybody else and the persona that he, he was at work. It was very similar to who he was at home. It was warm, it was welcoming, it was an inviting. And who he was at work and that strong presence that he had is very much the type of presence that I try and show now as a as a chick in the workplace. I try to kind of embody that that fine line between, you know, presence, strong presence and, you know, warmth and, and you know, comedic timing. But I think that <laughs> that's that that's what my dad showed me, so that's exactly what I try and do. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Jill. We we have talked about that. I love that you brought that up, Mara, because we had Mitch McDeer, who was the creator of Spuds McKenzie, on, uh, and she and Jill and I all have that exact same feeling. I think it's interesting that successful women in business definitely seem to take cues from their dads, from their fathers. Mm-hmm. Right. That's right. She had a very strong relationship with her dad because she went to work there, and right, that was cool. And I thank you, Mara, too, for you should you should become our co-host because you've got to tie in our final kind of good, bad, and indifferent right back into our t- our topic. Our you're topic. welcome. <laughs> I know, nicely well, done, Mara. Yeah, that, you're that welcome. A very nicely done tie-in segue, and <laughs> I think you need. I think you're going to take my job. <laughs> no way. We can always have three. Yeah. I can just you know come on the show whenever you want. Oh, yay! Yeah. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming, Mara, and any final thoughts for ladies out there looking for work? I mean, I think my, my final thought would be make sure you present yourself to be the woman that you want to develop into. Don't just think about who you are today, but the professional that you want to be. I think that if more women push themselves in that, in that way, then you're going to have stronger, more, more focused, and more balanced women in the workplace. I love it. Well, I guess uh, thanks again, Jill and Mara, for another great Crash and Glass podcast. So we just wanted to mention before we wrap today that please feel free to go to our website, www.basenettv.com, and click on Become a Producer, an Executive Producer. And if you can give a dollar, or all you have to do is give a dollar, but if you can give $5 or $10, that portion of that money goes to the Jimmy Fund, and please also log on to BaseNetTV.com because we just did a a video piece from the Jimmy Fund Scooper Bowl, which is where they do a lot of fundraising for the Dana-Farber Institute for Cancer. So please help us out, become an executive producer, and check out our coverage of the 2012 Jimmy Fund Scooper Bowl. Okay, that's it for this week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jill.